operator to swivel around and, uh, and show you in your embarrassment. <laughs> Enough. Yeah, good morning, church, um, both here in the building, including Kim, um, and online. Um, though at the moment, I think people online can't hear, so uh, they can now, I'm told. Right, good. Right, church leaders, like Kim and myself, um, are invited to lead prayers on Sunday morning, and uh, it's my privilege to lead prayers today. Now, recently, when I've been preparing um, to lead prayers, I've reflected on prayer itself. And in thinking about what to pray about, I've been led to pray about praying, as I did last time. Prayer is a vital part of our individual journeys with Jesus. It's a vital part of the life of this church. And yet prayer is something that many of us, certainly me, certainly I struggle with. On Thursday, uh, I was on my way to the Good Soil Farm, a little later than usual. So I was able to listen to the daily service on Radio 4. The service was led by the Reverend Richard Carter, and he told this story about the former Archbishop Michael Ramsey. When he was asked how long he spent in prayer each day, the Archbishop replied, about two minutes. His questioner, as you are, was surprised and said, but Archbishop, I've just seen you on your knees for the last two hours. <coughs> yes, replied Michael Ramsey, it takes me about two hours to pray for two minutes. Richard Carter went on to say that he can sympathize so often when we try to pray, our heads are like waterfalls of thoughts, dreams, plans, and anxieties. On Tuesday last week, the Beta Group, which is comprised of people who've been on the Alpha Course, um, and is led by Lisa Adams, began a series on prayer using Pete Gregg How to Pray materials. In the first video, Pete Gregg quotes Rabbi Abraham Heschel, who says delightfully that prayer is the humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. Prayer is the humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. So today, I would like us to pray about the Beta Group and their studies on prayer. I would also like us to pray about the day of prayer that Anne Harwood is leading on the 8th of March. Yes, it does seem like a long way off, but it is an important day for the church and one on which we hope to hear from each other what God has been saying to us. So it's a day to prayerfully prepare for. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that through your example and your teaching and by your Holy Spirit, we can come to you in prayer. We thank you for the Peter Group and pray that they will be blessed by their studies on prayer. We thank you for Pete Gregg and for the materials provided and pray that participants will find them useful. We pray that as a result, they may grow in their relationship with you, that they may deepen their love for you, draw closer to you, and be helped on their journey as your disciples. We thank you, Lord, for Lisa Adams, and pray that you will guide her and give her wisdom as she nurtures this Beta group. And Lord, we pray over the plans for the day of prayer in March. We thank you for Anne Harwood and the leadership she gives in the prayer life of this church. We pray that as she plans and prepares, she may discern your will for the focus of the day and organize the day accordingly. We pray that Anne might know how much to do herself and what to ask for help with, and that on the day, Anne might find the right balance of doing and being. For the day itself, we pray that everyone might make this a priority and find ways to be there in person. There is something special about meeting together rather than praying in our homes. Lord, we pray that the organization of the day will run smoothly and nothing will hinder us from being open to the words and pictures you have for us. We pray that everyone might feel included and know that their contribution is valued. As we prepare for the day, may we set aside our own priorities and agenda for St. Peter's Baptist Church, but rather spend time in your word and in prayer in the coming weeks so that we may carefully listen and discern your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Hello. 
we're going to go into a time of um, sort of re- reflective worship now. So we're going to stay in that um, that attitude that we've just been um, praying in. Feel free to sit and sing or to stand and sing. Um, we're going to sing uh, the potter's hand to prompt us now.
each one of us free. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And will you anoint Andy to speak your words to us? In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Uh, thanks, band, for leading us so well. So this morning we are starting a new uh, preaching series that we're going to be going through for the next couple of months. And over the, the autumn I was seeking God for, what, what do you want to say to us as a church as we move into a new year? What is it uh, that you want to say and encourage us and build us forward with? And is there a particular book of the Bible that we should be studying or whatever, or a series that we should be doing? And I really felt God lead us uh, to this. Uh, we've been looking for a while and, and, and feeling as a church that we're receiving um, encouragement from God, as, as he always will, but particularly at the moment, to dig deeper into discipleship, to explore discipleship further, to want to press into him more, to follow him more closely. And picking up on, on those themes, um, uh, we, we're going to be pressing into this series on Galatians for the next couple of months, learning how to live right, live in the way that Jesus was teaching us to do uh, and to follow him closely and well and live authentically for him. And we need to learn how to really embrace the gospel message and live it out authentically in deepening maturity and in deepening community. Uh, and I feel that this, this is going to help us to do that over the next weeks. I feel that God has, has laid this on my heart and uh, hopefully on your heart as well that we dig into this and explore it together. This book has a few central themes and messages, including uh, the law, uh, faith, building faith, uh, and living by the Spirit. But all of the themes that there are in the book come under an overarching theme in many respects of being free as children of God, living free, living as God intended us to live, free as children of God, free in Christ. And I want us to explore this idea of freedom. I want us to explore what that really means for us. What is true freedom? What is it to be free? What was God calling us into in freedom uh, as he, you know, he, he died for us and set us free, as we've just sung? What does that really mean for us? But at the start of this series, I'd just like us to explore together, just for a couple of minutes, uh, the question, what does freedom mean to you? What does it look like to you? So maybe we can just get into uh, pairs or people you've come with or little groups and just for two or three minutes, just ask each other that question. What does freedom mean for you? Uh, and let's discuss that now. Just, yeah, just for, just for two minutes, two or three minutes, let's do that.
Okay, so we just uh, bring those short conversations uh, to, a, to a close. Maybe one or two people could just tell me what, what freedom means to them. Somebody just shout out, what, is, what does it mean for you? Discipline. Discipline. Interesting word, yeah. I think that's very true. Freedom to read the Bible, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely, that freedom that we have in this country that um, means that we're free to worship together and read the Bible and hold Bibles, absolutely. Put God first, yeah, and then Tim? Freedom from. Freedom from, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not bound. Not bound. Choice. Lydia? Respect. Anyone else? Oh, Bob? Not being shackled by the past. Not shackled by the past. Kim? Freedom from anxiety. Freedom from anxiety. Mm. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. Mm. Really broad, isn't it? Really, really broad subject. Freedom. Uh, and uh, uh, just down here, we, we, we were chatting about different things. You know, free, free to... Well, free, freedom means a babysitter. That was one of the things <laughs> that, I, that, that came out from the front row. Uh, that's, that's kind of true. But uh, fr freedom, what does it mean? A sense of not being locked down, not being controlled, not being restricted, all of those sorts of things. Those are the things that you're free from and free to be, to live, I guess, as God intended us to. But, you know, those, those things of being locked down, controlled and restricted, those are the accusations that people have had about the church over the years, aren't they? You know, that we like to control people, we like to lock things down and have our routines and it has to be like this and we're very uh, controlling and all of those sorts of things. What does God want for us in terms of freedom? One of the times that I felt really free was when I was strapped to a burly Frenchman. Let me explain. <laughs> so this, this is me and, and that's Ruth. Uh, and this is Chamonix and by Mont Blanc, uh, and we went parapenting or paragliding, as some people might know it. Uh, and oh, it was beautiful. We went up on, on, this, uh, on this day, and it was a cloudy day. We had to wait for the clouds to lift before we could throw ourselves off the edge of the mountain um, <laughs> at 6,000 feet and, um, and glide around for half an hour. Uh, and it was exhilarating, it was freeing, you were just soaring, that sense of soaring because you take off and you go up rather than down because of the thermals uh, and uh, oh, it was just absolutely stunning uh, and beautiful, beautiful scenery and then they decided that you know, it was time to come to an end so it was time for aerobatics and we dropped out of the sky fairly quickly but it was a beautiful sense of drifting along in freedom and making progress and being able to go wherever you wanted to go and I loved it. Uh, and I would go and do it again in a heartbeat. It's not, Morvans aren't quite the same, and it wouldn't last quite the same length of time either. But, yeah, freedom. When might we feel free? All sorts of different times. I guess when we finish work for a holiday and we're free from all of those duties and responsibilities and obligations that may become with our work, and we're off, uh, able to go away and enjoy the things that we want to do, plan a holiday, get some time off, and do those sorts of things. I sense there's a freedom in that. Or finishing the end of term. I'm sure all those who work in churches or attend uh, schools uh, or, uh, or, or colleges or universities will have that sense of freedom at the end of a, a term or semester when there's a bit of time to relax. Uh, maybe there's freedom in an issue that has been resolved in your life, something that's been there for a while and it's now come to an end, there's, there's been resolution, there's been uh, a solution. Uh, freedom from a family problem, maybe. Maybe freedom from an unhealthy relationship. You know, freedom from illness, you know, that incredible moment when somebody maybe who's been suffering with cancer is told, is given the all clear. Uh, what freedom that must be in that moment. You know, freedom from addiction. The people have been struggling with things over, over years, alcohol, drugs, um, maybe smoking, maybe all sorts of other things that we can get so uh, chained down by. And with there's a moment of freedom when that no longer holds us. And that conjures up all sorts of feelings in our lives, I think, of joy and relief and excitement. Um, but also, I think, in, in freedom, there can also be negative feelings of fear and anxiety 
uh, maybe being lost. I was talking to somebody recently who's going into the new year, not really knowing what the year is going to hold. Um, not really uh, got many plans, just going to wait and see what un, 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 unfolds. And that's quite a nice sense of freedom in some respects, but also quite uh, a, a, a difficult challenge as well of, well, this isn't usual. I normally have my rhythms and routines. What does that mean for me? How do I cope with maybe some of the anxiety uh, of not having a job in that moment uh, and uh, living into the new year? It can, freedom can conjure up both positive and negative emotions and feelings within us. And we're going to look at the book of Galatians and dig into this and see what God wants to say to us about how to live for him. This letter of Paul's uh, is a, a beautiful letter, written in uh, AD 49, so it's an early letter, uh, one of his first. Uh, Paul has just finished his first missionary journey alongside Barnabas, uh, and uh, has been teaching in all sorts of places, and Galatia is one of those places, uh, in different cities there. Uh, and he's now in Antioch, and he's writing because he's heard some things that have concerned him, and he wants to bring some correction uh, and wants to teach the churches uh, the true gospel. Uh, and so he writes to these churches in Galatia, and Galatia is sort of southern Turkey, uh, and it's probably the, the southern part of Galatia, uh, so this, the central plain and down towards the coast in southern Turkey, uh, and he wants to speak into the lives of the Christians there, the new churches that are forming there. And it's not just to an individual that he writes on this occasion, um, or to an, an individual church, uh, but this letter is probably passed around a whole group of different churches and Christian communities for them to read and to understand and absorb. And, and here in Paul's time, Galatia was a Roman province located in the center section of present-day Turkey and down towards uh, the coast, as I've said, uh, a large fertile um, plain or plateau, uh, and there was really good agriculture there, and that's what drew a lot of people, new settlements, new towns being built, lots of people there, and of course Paul wants to speak to people, he wants to share the good news, so he goes to these communities, these cities, and shares this, uh, the, the good news of Jesus on his missionary journeys, and now he has uh, completed his first one, and he's writing to bring some further teaching and correction. Um, and you can sense within this letter the urgency that Paul has for those in Galatia that they will learn and understand some things that they are getting wrong. The main focus is freedom, uh, and he wants them to learn how to be free in Christ. Uh, and we're going to be picking up on all sorts of different things as we go through the next weeks. We've got nine sermons in this series, and it covers a whole uh, load of, of ground. And we've given each week a different title, uh, and they almost form a sentence in themselves, the different titles. We are free by grace, through faith, in truth, as children, to grow in Christ by his Spirit, to love with confidence. And um, that is the overarching themes of this book, and we're going to dig into that over these coming weeks. Uh, and I'm pleased to say we've got our preaching team that has been growing and developing over the last year or two, and we've done our preaching uh, course with Paul Campion uh, in the autumn, and a whole bunch of people are going to be preaching through this series uh, alongside me, which is great. But let's turn to these verses of Scripture, these first 24 verses uh, of this book, the first chapter, uh, and study this together. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than that you accepted, let them be under God's curse. I am now trying to win the approval. Am, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it, in, um, received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. If you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were the apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and to Silica, and I personally... Uh, un, um, Am I personally unknown to the churches of Judea uh, that are in Christ? They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Paul says a whole bunch of things through these first verses. He says he's sent by God to deliver this message. A message of grace. A message of grace. That's what we're picking up on this morning. Uh, we are free by grace but this is a message of grace, and he says, you need to listen to this. He says, what are you doing? What are you doing? There's a rebuke in these verses. What is this gospel that you are teaching and holding on to? And he's clearly angry. He says, you're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. That's quite an accusation, isn't it? You're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, and he says that those who do so will be under God's curse. That they have changed Paul's teaching uh, and that now it is negatively impacting Gentiles, Gentiles that he was called to speak to and call into the kingdom of God. The gospel he preaches, he says, is of God. He says, I'm serving God, I'm not people pleasing, I'm not people pleasing, I am serving God and he makes a strong case for his own providence and the providence of the message, the gospel that he carries which he says is the only and true gospel. He says in verse 11, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was it taught. Uh, rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He says the true gospel that he holds and his teaching is, has been revealed to him by Jesus Christ. And he wants them to believe him. But you can tell in these verses that he knows that some are questioning him. Some don't believe him. Some think they have a better gospel, uh, better understanding, and that Paul is wrong. And he's not happy. Uh, and it's quite clear in these verses, you know, he often has a nice introduction to a letter um, uh, and spends various verses at the beginning sort of bringing all sorts of greetings to people. And he's pretty concise this time. He's straight down to business and he brings a rebuke. You need not to pervert the gospel, uh, and I need to correct you. He says what he has brought to them is true. He says, I'm not making it up. Look at who I was. Look at what I am now preaching. Look at the, I was the person who persecuted Christians. I am now the one telling you all about the gospel. And he says, God has shown him such grace he has taught him the gospel of which he shares. 
Now, the, the reason that they are questioning Paul, those in Galatia, particularly the Jews in Galatia, are questioning Paul, is around the issue of apostleship. They are questioning his authority uh, and his authenticity as an apostle. Now, in those days, there was the understanding that those who had been particularly sent by Jesus, who had been with Jesus and sent by Jesus, were the true apostles. And that suggested that uh, Paul was like a, a second-hand um, apostle. He wasn't the authentic apostle. And that they had now gone back and spoken to people who were true apostles, who had been with Jesus, and they understood the gospel in a different way, uh, and they were applying it differently. Now, that wasn't fair and it wasn't true and Paul wanted to correct that and he says I have received the message I have received the gospel from Jesus Christ he has given me revelation it is authentic it is straight from Jesus I am not a second-hand apostle I am a true and authentic one and my message is true the gospel I have shared with you is right and I need you to understand it And you can understand his annoyance. He's been there on this missionary journey. He's done all of his teaching. He's helped to plant churches and Christian communities. uh, And now they're thinking that they know better than he does. Uh, And he is frustrated. Uh, And there are clearly some big issues going on here. And these issues are all around freedom. Freedom being this big focus of this book. Now, Gentiles... Um, didn't have to obey Jewish law. They were free in Christ. And and that's what Paul has been preaching. And this is challenging and big news to the Jews. The the Jews, the the first Christians were Jewish. They were uh, living their lives and practicing their lives as Jews. And Paul had brought all sorts of teaching that was correcting that and saying, look, there's, there's a new way to be now. But they were still holding on to their traditions and the law and different practices and holding on to it tightly. And Paul brings this letter into their context. And it's like a charter. It's like a blueprint uh, for how to live free. That they're in a new time, a new season, a new way to be. uh, And that they need to learn this and they need to understand it for themselves. Paul explains the reality of our liberty is freedom from law. Freedom from the power of sin. Freedom to live for Christ. And as he uh, famously writes, and is one of the key verses out of the whole of this letter, in Galatians 5, verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Christ has come. Christ has brought freedom. Let's live in it. And he wants them to get this and understand it. We will come to more of that teaching in verse, uh, in chapter 5, a little later in the series. The reality is, we try to re-entrap ourselves, re-sort uh, of, uh, I don't know, incarcerate ourselves. We find it difficult to live in the freedom that God has for us, to live in that liberty. And we often enchain ourselves in all sorts of ways. Uh, That's very much the human condition, isn't it? We make mistakes, we mess up, we put all sorts of things upon ourselves and don't live as God wants us to do. And Paul wants us to understand the message that we are free. And an amazing thing has happened. Jesus has done such an incredible thing for us out of his grace to set us free that we might live in this freedom. And he implores us to do so. Freedom, in this sense, the freedom that Paul is talking about is a bit of a paradox. Uh, He talks about a wonderful and sort of open freeway of liberty, uh, and it's it's quite clear that the the freedom that he's talking about is is profound and beautiful and complete. Uh, So we've got this sort of freedom, a free way of liberty that is paradoxically a narrow way of salvation. Does that make sense? This paradox of of being free, but the only way to really be free is to practice the ways of Jesus. Paul wants us to understand that the old ways are no more, but there is a clear path ahead that leads to true freedom. William Barclay says this about the matter. Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought. R.C. Sproul says, 
the only freedom that man ever has uh, when, he becomes, he's, when he becomes a slave to Jesus Christ. Fairly punchy, short quotes that state the clear situation here, that freedom is to practice the ways of Jesus, to do as we ought, to do as we ought in the way that Jesus would have us do, to be a slave to Jesus for the freedom that we find in doing so. I came to faith when I was 21, uh, and uh, it was a joyous experience, but it was also a challenging experience. I spent two years exploring faith, going to church every Sunday, trying to work out, was this for me? Did I really want to commit my life? Uh, did I believe this? Was, uh, was I ready to make that commitment and commit the rest of my life to following Jesus? Uh, and I spent two years exploring that. And I came to a point where I felt I either needed to make the commitment or I wanted to stop going to church because it, it just felt like, you know, I've done enough exploring now. This is about faith, I need to make a call. And I made the call and I decided to follow Jesus. And it was a joyous moment and a, a fantastic little season uh, in my life that brought about so much change. And it was joyous, but it was, as I said, it was challenging. And the reason that it was challenging was I was at university at the time, and I had this sense that God was going to call me into something completely different from what um, I was doing at university. I was doing a building surveying degree, and that turned out to be the case. I didn't go into a long career in building surveying. I did a couple of years of it. Uh, and then felt God calling me into different things. I, I felt uh, that everything around me was changing. I, I think we often talk about, oh great, somebody's come to faith, isn't that beautiful, isn't that wonderful? But we don't necessarily recognize that that can be a challenging season where there's so much changing. The old has gone, the new has come, but what does that really mean? Working that out, uh, working out the, the things that we have to give up, the new things that we want to start doing. And I'm working that all through and working with Jesus with that. And God revealing some challenging things to us about the ways maybe that we've been, that we need to, to stop doing uh, and learn how to create new habits and a new way to live and to serve him in different ways. And I think for those who come to faith fairly quickly, um, but maybe not brought up in faith and might, you know, those who have, who have said that they've always felt like Christians, maybe don't experience that moment quite in the same way. But I certainly felt uh, really excited and blessed and joyful and also quite lost and trying to work out what all of that meant. Uh, and it was, a, it was a challenging, a really challenging season for me as I started my faith journey. And I think that's a lot of what is going on here with the Jews in Galatia. You know, we're talking about life anew, free from things and free to be things. Uh, but the Jews here were trying to work out what all of that meant. As I've said, the earliest Christians were Jews that believed in the Messiah, uh, and they kind of had a bit of a dual identity. They saw themselves very much as Jews, but they also knew that the Messiah was, uh, had come, and they wanted to follow him and practice the ways of Jesus. Uh, and they wanted to live as good Jews, and they wanted to embrace the new. And that was, that was hard. That was hard for them. A really difficult culture and circumstances uh, and sort of dichotomy in some respects. And I get it. I really do. From my own personal story of, of that sort of challenge of coming to faith, I felt really split down the middle. And I think the Jews here do. They, they wanted Gentile believers to adopt Jewish law and practices and customs. Uh, and especially there was a, a, a big issue around... Um, circumcision. The Jews really felt that this was very important, and the Gentiles, well, it wasn't quite so popular with the Gentile chaps. Uh, and I understand that as well. So, now there was a, there was a, a group of people, uh, a group of Jews who were maybe a little bit more on the extreme, and they were called Judaizers. Uh, and for them, this was a massive issue. The Gentiles needed to become Jews before they could become Christians because they needed to fulfill the law because they believed that fulfilling the law was the route to salvation. Uh, and they, they were confused how Paul could be saying that that no longer needed to be the case. They felt that the, the Jewish practices, traditions, the law, the fulfillment of it, circumcision, all of those things were still right and they wanted Gentiles to 
change their culture to become like them. And they were pushing hard, and they were putting a lot of force and um, manipulation onto the Gentiles at the time to become like them. And they were angry, and they were disappointed, I think, that the ways that they knew were changing. And I think there was a lot of sort of confusion for them. Now, this caused a real issue. This was a big hot potato issue of the time. Uh, the, uh, for Gentiles, this was, a, this was a new thing. It had always been about the Jews, and now it's Gentiles as well. Anyone can come. Uh, and that was a really big issue. And as we know, within the life of churches, people take different positions on some things, uh, and that can cause a lack of unity at times, and it can create these real hot potato issues that can do quite a bit of damage at times. One of the things that we're looking at culturally at the moment as churches in the UK and around the world is to do with same-sex relationships. And we know that people take very strong and different opinions on those things, and that they can affect the church uh, in the same way that we can look back and see the troubles of the early church. And maybe this was the biggest area of conflict for them. The Judaizers putting pressure on those, uh, the, um, the Gentiles to become like them. And they're keeping the law, uh, it was a salvation issue to the Jews. You've, you've got to do this, otherwise you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were really fueled up to try and make sure that it would happen. Uh, and Paul wanted to say, stop. The true gospel is this. It's different. There is a new way. You need to let this go. Your salvation is by grace and through faith only. The gospel is for Jews and Gentiles to both live a new life that is free in Christ. God is creating one big family as he promised to do. You need to listen up. You need to get your facts straight. It's all about grace. Jews really believed that keeping the laws and traditions were extremely important. And they felt that the person was saved by following the law of Moses and the Mosaic Covenant. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. We talked about covenant last Sunday. And we talked about the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, you know, the Jews wanted to keep that. Good Jews would keep that. And it was a good and noble thing to do for them. You know, it was their, uh, the way that they would live. Uh, and it was so central to them. Surely they weren't just to throw this all away. Surely what they'd been doing, observing, and basing their lives around for hundreds of years wasn't just to be thrown away as worthless. It was who they were, their moral code, their right living, their culture, cultural and religious identity. And now Gentiles are accepted. Were they just to come in and not have to obey the, play by the rules? Paul explains it's not about keeping the law. It's not about carrying out traditions. It's not about being circumcised that makes you right with God. That's the whole point. That's why Jesus had to, to come as Messiah. That's why he had to die on the cross uh, for our sins. Keeping the law can't make us right. Being right with Jesus is the way to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus took the sin of the world upon his shoulders, dying on a cross and rising on the third day that we could be made right with him. The precious gift of grace that we have been given is due to the love of Jesus that he has for all of us. And this could make the way possible. Yes, you do need to let go of laws and traditions. Jesus has come to fulfill the law and you are in a new time, a new season, with a new way. You need to embrace this true gospel message, Paul says. Live, it, live in it wholeheartedly. This is the way of freedom. Freedom in Christ. He says that this message is for everyone. God loves the world so much that he sent Jesus to live and set us free because of his great love and what he would do on the cross and rising on that third day. Jew and Gentile, all included, nobody left out. Freedom by grace for all who accept it. That was the true gospel message for those uh, in Galatia. That is the true gospel message for us. Each one of us in this room, each one of us in this community, in this city, 
in this country, in the world. That is who Jesus has come for. And we can have a relationship with him, each of us, because of his grace. The greatest freedom that we have is to be able to come to God and to be able to come to him at any time. A.W. Tozer says this, true and absolute freedom is only found in the presence of God. And we can all come and find it. Joyce Meyer uh, says, if you want to be free, just start doing what God wants you to do. Come and be with him. Have a relationship with him. Understand him and live for him. And do it all by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So what ways are we living that are not God's ways? They were doing that in Galatia. They were getting it wrong. They were trying to work it all out and make sure that they were living in freedom. And the reality is, I expect we all at times end up going down cul-de-sacs, going down paths that don't lead to fulfilling that freedom and to living for him in the freedom that he has um, bought at a price for us. Do we impose our own ideas, our own ideologies, prejudices on top of God's word? You know, at times, I'm pretty sure we do, don't we? Do we intentionally or otherwise live our own gospel? Do we fully understand the gospel? And do we make sure that we are completely free within it? I think at times we compromise that. Do we turn down the narrow way of complete freedom to end up in a cul-de-sac of false liberty? Do we justify some of the things that we do? Do we go our own way, walk our own path? To live in that place of complete freedom all of the time, getting it right 100% of the time, is probably not a reality for any of us. And yet that's our desire. Can we sometimes be a bit like the Judaizers? Putting up obstacles for other people to come into the kingdom because of our own feelings, our own attitudes, our own prejudices. You know, with the best of intentions of wanting to get it right, but sometimes not getting it right. Do we sometimes throw our own freedom away for things that we really shouldn't? Do we die on hills that are hills that we should never be dying on? You know, the church hasn't got the greatest track record on some of these things over the years, has it? You know, we we think of slavery and racism when we think of, you know, women and and sexism. You know, we've messed up as a a whole church over the years and got things wrong and put obstacles in the way for others to be able to, to live freely as God has called them to do. I wonder if individually we hold on to things that are not part of a true gospel? What excuses do we make for some of the ways that we live in? Do we come to God with an open heart and wanting his leading? Is it completely open? Are we completely sold out to him? Are we full of just following him? Let's be like that. Let's go for that. Let's choose to follow him in that way. Let us be open to his teaching, to his rebuke, to his leading. Psalm 139, verses 23, 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We can get ourselves into all sorts of situations, all sorts of cul-de-sacs that stop us growing and maturing in him, that take away our liberty and freedom. What are the areas of your life where you are chained and bound? What limits your liberty? The early church was being born and some Jews uh, were becoming Christians, some Gentiles were too. Both were finding it hard to, uh, to live in the liberty that they've been given. Throwing off the old ways uh, and commencing the new wasn't coming easy. And the freedom that awaited them was not being fully embraced. 
let's not be like that. Let's embrace the fullness of the liberty that God has given to us. What is holding you back from living in the freedom that God intends for you? Traditions, expectations, relationships. Stuck in a relationship that's limiting that. You know, habits, addictions. What is God putting his finger on in your life where he wants to free you so that you can enjoy the freedom and liberty that he has paid the price for and won for you? Is God asking you to let something go, to give something up, to choose a new way? He paid the price for our sins. It's by grace that we're set free. Let us cast off our old ways and live in the new ways, free as he is offering us. Some of the final words of the Bible, as we find at the end of Revelation, are an invitation to live in these ways of freedom. Revelation 22, 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride says, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Come. Drink. Live. It's free. There's no price. And you can be free in Christ. We've sung some beautiful words. I think uh, earlier on this morning we sang Amazing Grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. Let's pray. Father God, as we journey into these scriptures, as we look at this letter over the next uh, few weeks, Lord, will you reveal to us the truth of the gospel, the gospel, the gospel that Paul preached and taught, the true gospel. May we understand afresh, may we understand anew. May you reveal to us new depths of your grace and mercy and love. And may we journey into the freedom that you have bought for us. To walk the narrow way of freedom. Into the wide place of freedom that is in you. May we be free in you. May we follow you closely. May we go into this deeper discipleship in the weeks ahead. May we mature. Lord, we set our hearts on you. We set our minds on on you. We praise you for what you have done for us. We are so grateful. May we live in that, the fullness of the freedom that you have won for us. May we place our lives in you as children of God, free in Christ. And may our lives glorify you. Teach us, Lord. Encourage us, Lord. Um, may you Help us to move forward. And I pray this morning for those who are choosing to let go and to look at areas of their lives where they need freedom, where they need new liberty. I pray in the name of Jesus against addiction. For the chains that hold people in this place. I pray for freedom for those who are bound and held back. Lord, will you break those chains of addiction and set them free? I pray for those who are held in relationships that are not healthy. I pray for answers and solutions that they might find freedom. Freedom to live for you. I pray for those who are wanting to walk a new path, whose habits do not honor you, and they recognize that in this place this morning. And as we say sorry and repent, Lord, will you lead us in your ways and for your glory. By your spirit, Lord, will you fill us afresh? Will you free us afresh? May we know the liberty that is found in you.
Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. May our lives, individually and together as a church family, represent and glorify your holy name. And may we all live for the true gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. stand together.
Oh, we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. Uh, we praise you, Lord, for the liberty we have in you. May we live for you in the week ahead in those ways. Let us join together in our closing prayer. Father God, as you lead, lead us out onto our front lines, help us to love you, each other, and our communities, to release the gifts you've given us, and to invite others to meet with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. We have soul food this evening at 6.30. Please do come along to that, uh, where we'll be... Uh, uh, pressing further into the book of James. Uh, if you'd like prayer this morning, there'll be a prayer team available at the front left. Please do come down and be prayed for for any issue. If we could have one or two people just help us to arrange the chairs in just a few minutes after people have been prayed for, that would be great uh, so that we can get organized for this evening. Uh, but otherwise, do come downstairs and uh, stay for, for coffee and fellowship uh, and let's encourage one another. If you've been connecting online, it's been great to have you with us. Uh, may God bless you all. Amen.